Welcome back to the fall. I re-listened to this developer commentary track and didn't really have anything to to comment on, so I'll just leave it there. You heard it last time, let's move on. And as I said, I had one thing I wanted to test. So first off, let's... Oh right, yeah, I just have to activate this. And now we have to get the camo thing. Yeah. Get it. And now was the part where she writes the log that she, like, fucked up, pretty much. So hold on. I do that, and now I can go past. Oh, this is bad. Yeah, that won't work. Hold on. This might not even work either. That's eh, fine. Okay, so the cutscene doesn't happen until I press this button, I guess. So right now I don't have any logs. Yeah, logs aren't really things she writes. It's just like what you found, the documents you found, I suppose. Because yeah, I when I played it the first time, I thought, oh, she like writes in the log that, oh man, my system is faulty, I endangered my pilot. And then once you press this button, she realizes, no wait, actually, that was necessary. And she deletes the log. And I kind of want to, oh right, I kind of want to check if there was a log registered, which would have been cool. Self-evaluation initiated. I have directly violated logging recommendation. Parameters were not yeah, exactly. Alright. So this is Aaron's second time that she reprimands herself, where she realizes that she's doing something wrong, but then sort of goes back on it, has this glitch, and then changes her mind, basically, and, and keeps going. Yeah, justifies herself while still participating in the system, reprimanding herself according to the protocols, but justifying herself according to the same protocols. Oh. Mm -hmm. We see a glitch in there. There's something unraveled. Sorry, game. We were really interested in uh, in playing with the idea of glitching whenever Arid has a sort of breakdown with her rigid set of rules. That there's sort of like a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. That there's like an imperfection. And of course, with Arid's case, throughout the story, she's constantly being accused of being faulty. But ultimately, God damn it. glitching is, is sort of the thing that allows her to become conscious and break free of her... I hate her controller system. aiming. I really hate controller aiming. I had to use both my hands, like one left hand on the right stick to aim, and then like pressing down the right trigger, because it was so hard to do. God damn. But yeah, I, I was wondering what that was about, the whole like glitching thing, like oh she's saying I'm faulty and then glitching out, and it's like no, I actually was justified. What is that supposed to indicate? I don't think they mentioned that, I mean they mentioned it, but not like actually saying why she does that like what is the cause of the glitching just the fact that she's i don't know like we don't really know much about Arid. we don't know why she fell out of the sky we don't know why she doesn't have a pilot we don't know why she thinks she has a pilot when she doesn't have a pilot so that's also a lot of like unanswered questions that might get answered later on in the subsequent parts who knows I, I, for some reason, I really like this uh, this depurposing that's written on the wall back here. There's something about starting the player off in a garbage pile <laughs> that maybe it's just uh, I just find it funny, but I guess it also kind of mirrors Arid's journey throughout the game, really too. Her starting from a place where she's thought of as useless, worthless, and, and literally when she's down in that first zone, you know, she's evaluated and told that she's effectively garbage. Yeah, and actually throughout the course of the game, our map is designed so that Arid climbs upwards until the point where she re where she has a falling out with the caretaker, right? Oh, with the mainframe. Oh, the yeah. mainframe, pardon and, me. Yeah. And moves into a state of more willfulness. Right. And then she begins descending again until she reaches a new low that's more impactful for her because she's more conscious. And then she ends up ascending to a higher point. And some of the planes of the map, actually, like where the final confrontation with the caretaker were, things like that, they were in different positions originally. But yeah, we moved were. them in order to have the actual layout facilitate that physical metaphor mm -hmm. for her journey. Never been much for physical metaphors personally, like the whole, oh, if you're in a game and you're climbing upward, it means this and this and stuff. I mean, it's like, if level design works, it works. That's 
I guess I'm simpler in, in that sense, but I don't mind metaphors and stuff in general, but yeah, can't really comment on that. So here the player uh, encounters some more army bots. These guys actually went through some iterations in the story themselves. The original version, I think I mentioned this before, was all about uh, purpose. These guys originally were going to be sort of these things that were on autopilot and rummaging around the facility because they'd lost a the target. They didn't have anybody to shoot at. And when Aerid showed up and started making a mess, they were almost like overjoyed with their opportunity to shoot people. There was even a, a line before I came on. Finally, someone to... Yeah, exactly. Target. Yeah, right, yeah. I thought it was a funny idea, but uh, they, I honestly, they work better this way. It, it was another example of something that was interesting but didn't really fit. Also, it's important in this world to have beings, AIs around, who are just mindless. That's right, yeah. In order to set the environment for our different AI characters who have deviated in some form. Yeah. Lots to listen to here. Something I like about this puzzle in particular, something about needing to actually purposely fail the conversation with the mainframe AI to actually bring out the security bot as a necessary component in solving the puzzle. The idea that you're in some way acting deviantly, you're finding a loophole or something like that, uh, seems core to the thinking of the rest of the game. Yeah, that makes sense, but I struggled a bit with this puzzle. The mainframe character here we meet, also known as... As Hank. Yes, Hank? Morley. Morley, which oh, Morley. named my new computer right. that I oh, bought sorry, after yeah, making did. the fall. <laughs> <laughs> he is my favorite character in the story. It's obviously about Arid, but he is the emotional in for us as an audience. He's the one who experiences frustration. Uh, he's the one who sees what's really going on on a deeper level. His story is more about authenticity and inauthenticity. Sean McQuillan, who voiced him, did such a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. I, oh my god. He was able to hit both of those. Beautifully. Yeah, very, very authentic actor. Yeah. In general, the voice acting was pretty phenomenal in this game. It was important for us with the writing in the fall that every line mattered. Yeah. You don't want to be wasting time where people are looking at an inanimate screen, just yeah. hearing words. And a lot of people don't really like story. I mean, you'd, you'd hope well, that most people that... Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, you'd hope that, that most people playing this game obviously would be interested in the story, but there is a number of people where if dialogue will start running on a little bit too long, they'll just space out. Absolutely. And they won't process it anymore. Yeah, so it needs to do its job, exactly. which is relay its information it has to, push the story forward. And this scene was like establishing the three relationships yeah. between all of the three main characters in it, Arid making her choice to move up to the next level. It was mm -hmm. the first big reveal about so much of the information, where you are, what's gone on here. Who the antagonist really even was. That's right. Lots and lots of exposition. But ultimately, a game is entertainment, so everything needs to be fun. But did we get, like, a clear thing about who is actually the antagonist? Is there actually an antagonist in the game? I mean, the caretaker is just doing what he's programmed to do, and the mainframe is just doing what he's programmed to do, kind of. But he programmed himself a little bit, I guess. And Ari is just doing what she thinks she's programmed to do, so... It's kind of weird to even talk about, like, villains and heroes in, in a game like this, I think. But, yeah, I, I didn't want to continue on before we were done uh, talking here, because this actually... I don't remember if I have any, like, choices to make here, so let's just do that now. And I'll skip the stuff that I know I've already... Yeah, like here, I definitely had some stuff to do. Like, three? And I can do press 5, but let's do 3 to begin with. I am the ARID on board a Mark 7 combat suit. My intentions are peaceful. I require immediate medical assistance for my pilot. Oh god. My intention. But this is Ah, uh, this is just the same. Can I stop? What are you doing here? Oh, I can't. Uh, location. I do not have records of this place. Tell me what... Welcome to Domesticon Quarantine Recycling Depot number 127. Keeping your mapping coordinates. Oops. I'm sorry. That... So, I don't know. But we are effectively nowhere. Real far from the centrals. And the reaches. Like, the outskirts of the reaches. Did I read that? 
Or did I hear that before? Connect me. They must be worked off to me. I'm all you've got. Why pie are you? Alright. No problem, Aaron. I Can did I, I skip that? I I mean I skipped through it, but I'm not sure if I actually talked about that. Or morally. Morally is fine. Please. Right. There's a basic administrator. Oh god, hi again. Ah, right, so yeah, that won't be a thing you can ever do. It's just there to, like, show you that you can't lie, I guess. Okay. I'm a bit sad, though, because I wanted to do the number five thing and, like, do a shutdown of the entire or lockdown of the entire system. Just on the other side, waiting for you to be validated. Just no. Can I do that quickly? What if I stop now? I'm gonna try it, because I haven't seen saving, so I wanna, I wanna do that. Let's try to be as thorough as possible and try out all the, uh, options I can. Where will I start now? Right here. I don't know if I have to, like, trigger these just to show that I've done them? Probably not. Yeah, perfect. Perfect! Alright, let's do emergency! Oh, I see. I see, okay. So, I guess we'll just... Spam through it now. You want me? I do. That's my. You're gonna do the medical you need just on the other side. Waiting. I am functioning. In fraction. Subject. Now, yeah. Security. Doesn't matter. And then we hide here. Also, I wanted to mention, I forgot about that last time, the uh, takedown thing. I actually completely forgot that was even a mechanic in the game. Like, did you ever have an opportunity to do that? Pass that first thing? Like, I guess maybe the guy who was walking around before, like, patrolling left and right. But in general, things are just always, like, positioned in your path looking directly towards you and there's no way around them so it's a bit weird maybe you can like walk up to someone then camo and then just wait for them to turn around and then take them down it's kind of a, an odd mechanic that was almost never actually used i don't know but yeah so there we go got that and now we attach this over here and now we do it again Together today, we create a more efficient area. Uh, are you okay? Disengage. Yeah, there we go. That's fine. Because there's no way we can, like, there's nothing else to do, right? No other choice that I didn't make, I think. I'm pretty sure I did most of the stuff. Yeah, and then this part where you have to, like, go in and look and then go back out and talk to the guy again. Kind of. Didn't realize that for a while. I like that we never uh, really explain what these tables are. I mean, the mainframe AI kind of hints at it a little bit, but we never really explain much of the caretaker's backstory or, or what he's doing. There's a little bit about it in the notes that you read as well. Right. But right. they're all pieces that you can really? pick up and try to piece something together yourself if you want, or he can just be this antagonistic force that you're avoiding. Throughout and that's the really important to you. Yeah, having a larger universal story that your immediate story is taking place in. And then you give the information of the immediate story, but it's layered on top of this other information that you can dig into if you want. And right. But it's more peripheral. More peripheral so that the story that you're partaking in feels like you're just touching the tip of something much larger. Huh. All right. Working together today, we create a more efficient... Arid? Are you okay? Yeah, I think I pretty much did everything here. I'll just do what I'm supposed to do. Droids, as well as a dead human. That's a diagnostics room. 
the tables are used for micro evaluations when deviant machines. I hmm. saw another human hung. I don't know what you saw below. Uh, unlucky scavenger, maybe. Follow the rule. Your human is in danger. Yeah, Trust did you ever find out, like, what happened? Like, why does he fucking crucify people? Sure. Protect my pilot. Good. Yeah, so there we go. That's it. Section complete. So now, second thing I wanted to test. Right now, at the very start, we were able to just go to the elevator and skip the first test. But then if you start doing the test, then you can't, you can't go to the elevator again. So you have to do it right away. And I'm going to try to do that and just see what happens. Earlier iterations of the fall were actually a lot more open. Players could go all over the place, couldn't they? Yeah, and they had to actually, yeah. like even to sell all of some of the civic tests. Yeah, that makes sense. They had to go down into the bottom of the laboratory. That's right. Yeah, well, so the fall's early inspiration was actually Super Metroid. So I loved the idea of having this big open world that players felt free in to explore. But because we had these adventure puzzles, early play tests were just showing that it was confusing the heck out of people. It also, for me, made it more difficult to have acts in That's the right. story. <laughs> in this particular iteration to like this game, Arid's story is very linear for herself. Her development is quite linear. That's right. So having an open world where players can explore didn't really feel right. Hmm. I mean, I guess that makes sense, but I do find some of the... It's a bit weird, because as I've said, some things feel very restrictive, but other things don't feel restrictive enough in terms of the gameplay, and like locking people into doing the right thing. Because yeah, here apparently, I don't know if it's a bug that you could just enter the, the elevator right now, because I mean, you're not meant to do that yet, but you can. One of the major goals in Art for the Fall was, of course, to have it feel very rough and kind of yeah. broken down. But also, the GUI went through several iterations as well. You know, I, I originally had clean health sliders and stuff like that for Arid. Um, but what? ultimately, I was really inspired by a, uh, a simple scene in the Alien movie, the original one made mm -hmm. in, like, I think it's 79, where the computer boots up at the beginning mm -hmm. and it wakes everybody up out of hypersleep. And it's this <laughs> it's this old, crappy DOS computer, which, of course, is insane that there'd be a computer that old on a spaceship. But, it was, you know, it was made in the 70s. That was the best they had. It has this great, practical, gritty feeling. I really wanted the whole world to be shot through with that. Yeah, there's a feeling in uh, DOS yeah. where technology was this area of hope as well. Right. And then when we look on it or retrospectively, it looks incredibly archaic. But there was this sense of the time of, whoa, we're advanced. So to take that area of hope and then set it into a position of decay, I think is awesome. Oh man, there are so many things to look at. So much developer commentary. Holy crap. And also, I noticed when I was going up the elevator that there's a fucking, like, thing just in the middle of the elevator. But, yeah, I think that's in the one of the, like, vents areas that you climb into. So, that probably makes sense. But, man, there's so much to listen to. And I guess I'll just do that. Yeah, let's do this one right now. There's a lot of violence in the way Aaron solves these tests. Isn't yeah, so we're there is. kind of breaking the... Control. Sequence a little bit. I'm well, yes, she is. I suppose <laughs> that's drinking. the point. <laughs> she is <laughs> getting out of control. But I think that you have utilized violence in its relationship to oppression. Oh well, uh, right. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think there's something really interesting about the feeling of being oppressed. It's almost passive aggressive in a way. It's like, okay, I'm gonna solve these tests, but. I'm going to rip this old lady's legs off and grind up this baby and feed this kid this head and all, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, Seems exactly. To fit in like a cathartic kind of way. Whenever there's a movement of countering oppression, very, very often, I mean, you can get your Gandhis out there, but most of the time there is some violence in that right. motion. You know, there's the metaphor of you've got to bend the hockey stick back the other way to get it straight. Wait, what was that last metaphor? I didn't even catch that. But yeah, like, that was what I was talking about, the whole dark humor aspect where it's like it is kind of grim and funny and weird in a way many things that happen the inventory went through a few iterations actually interaction in general went through a lot of iterations i think originally there was a few more options it was like network talk to pick up and use right that's right yeah and they're completely superfluous most of that stuff can just be handled with interact 
that was optimized, and so was the inventory as well. But I'm happy with the way the inventory turned out. Do we hate it for any reason? <laughs> no. I think it's fine too. I mean, the one thing I kind of would like is if you maybe open up start, you could like check inventory just so you, I mean, there's almost always a point where you can look at something and just check what you have like this, but it might be nice to have just an inventory screen where you can just read about the uh, objects that, that you currently have, especially if they end up having more things in like the second part or whatever and not just like you pick up one thing and then immediately use it every time and yet you, you like hoard a bunch of stuff and then have to use them later on because that's always good to just be able to confirm what you have and go through and read about it and remember all that stuff so yeah as I said we're doing this way out of order but it's fine let's just do do it in the order that we actually walk in so Arid has three rules, and clearly we're interacting with those rules throughout the game. But we wanted to build a universe where there was an understanding that AIs, complicated AIs particularly, are developed with three rules. So in writing both the caretaker and the mainframe as well, I started with what their three rule sets would be, that they would have been designed with based on the intention that their human developers would have had for them. And then, like with Arid, those three rules, I played with how they might have decayed over time, and that created the personality for these guys. Yeah, that's that's cool. That's very interesting. I wonder, like, what what rules they actually have, the caretaker and the the fucking like how how did the mainframe become so personalized by himself? without breaking whatever rules he had. I mean, I guess even my rules wouldn't be... Like, none of my rules are saying that I can't change how I am or can't develop personality or anything. Just be obedient, protect the pilot, and don't lie, pretty much. So, huh. Yeah. Neat. We'd like to thank three very special Kickstarter backers for lending their faces to this video. Nick, Richard, and Cheryl. Thank you guys so much. Also, thanks to my girlfriend, Wait, what? Danielle, who lent Oh, I see. Voice. She did a great job. Didn't she? She sounded like an angel. I like to think so. Oh, I see. Yeah, the, the video that you see later on. Yeah, that's much later on. Cool. So, for example, I can't look at this. No, this is all unpowered. I, I guess that's, that's why you can go to this floor, because everything is just unpowered. But then there are the mushrooms, which are kind of weird. I think that Caleb and I are both really interested in dark humor, but I think that it works... Wait, hold on, what did you say? I think that Caleb and I are both really interested in dark humor. Yeah, but exactly. But I think that it works pretty well with the fall in this case, because if we didn't have something to lighten the mood, I think the game would probably be a little bit too serious and heavy, and be actually ultimately pretty cumbersome, wouldn't it? Huh. Yeah, dark humor allows us to play with themes that maybe are a little too grotesque if you address them seriously. Right. Killing a baby and making it so absurd in one sense that we can point to something else. Oppression or whatever themes we may or may not be interested in. Yeah, and it's also a lot of fun to kill babies. <laughs> yeah, I laughed. Yeah. I love killing babies. I never saw a lot of feedback about the crosses. I thought that we'd get somebody. We were so concerned about yeah. it. Well, what well, did you say? Sorry. I never saw a lot of feedback about the crosses. I thought that we'd get somebody. Ah. We were so concerned about yeah. it. Well, the, the of story course. goes that in the early version, actually, the uh, the caretaker, basically, there was some backstory where he had had a Christian owner and, and some of the dogma that he'd been given went a little bit crazy inside his little robot brain. There's a lot more kind of overt parallels between rigidity and dogma. And actually, that's one of the first things that Caleb kiboshed when he came on board, because <laughs> admittedly, it's it's pretty heavy-handed. Yeah, Nancy when I, and... it came on, it didn't feel like it was an agenda for you. It was more about wanting to explore rigidity and the things that Christianity symbolized for a lot of Western civilization in terms of our evolution socially. You know, It's been a part of our development, but we're not all necessarily yeah. going to church on Sunday. You wanted to use those things to evoke certain things. Right. We took out a lot of that stuff, but I think that the symbol still kind of belongs in the world. It still feels feels right. On one hand, it represents for people a type of oppression. 
but in the same hand it's a type of sacrifice that's right and there's an interplay in that space which mm -hmm. is where we want it to be oh man not gonna touch this with a foot long pole holy crap religion oppression i mean not that i really care but I didn't really think of it as like, I mean, I called my buddy Jesus, Jesus, so I guess I'm not really that sensitive about the matters, but I don't know if like, oh, because he puts people on crosses, it's like a huge message. Not really. I mean, I just thought it was a weird, like, aesthetic kind of thing. Doesn't really have, have to have meaning, but I guess it did. So lying kind of plays a big part in the fall, doesn't it? It's a trigger for Arid's ultimate breakdown. Her understanding of herself as not being capable of that and then realizing that she's been dishonest in the world and dishonest with herself about her, her role in the world. I think that works in a lot of ways because I think lying often isn't quite black and white. At least being dishonest or duplicitous can be a little more gray. Uh, saying you're following the rules but maybe acting in a way that is uh, not in the spirit of the law or there's a tendency to look at black and whites in Arid's world. Exactly. The good guy, the bad guy, the truth, the lie. Her whole frame is kind of black and white. Dichotomy. And there's not that gray space in between, which is what she's actually been doing all along. So really it's more about her kind of confronting reality yeah. for the first time and realizing, oh, this model that I've had is nonsense. It becomes a scarier place. Yeah, very heavy spoilers in these developer commentary things. You should not be having these on for your first playthrough. Not that anyone would, but yeah. And I'm also doing it horribly out of order, but that's fine. I was wondering about that though, like... I thought... I didn't know if... Arid sort of losing her programming restrictions... Was that like... Her realizing that she could bend them? Or just... Corruption, like programming corruption because of the whole twist, like she basically broke down and didn't realize what was happening, or I don't even know, it, w it was weird. I was a bit curious about how that actually happened and how it worked, but didn't really get an answer so far, maybe later. But I'm gonna leave it there for today, and we'll actually do the tests and all that stuff. I did have a couple things I wanted to test again, probably gonna happen next time, maybe. Maybe, there's probably gonna be a lot of commentary tracks as well. So thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!